As a lot of you guys know, Gigabyte graphics cards have been cracking, and this was mostly brought to light by Lewis Rossman, so a big shout out to him for bringing this to the community, because it's very hard to repair this thing. And Gigabyte doesn't seem to be consistently giving returns to people for their products that have been broken in this way. Add in board partner, basically companies like Gigabyte, Asus, and MSI, for example, that make these graphics cards. Gigabyte isn't the first AIB to have problems issuing RMAs. So is this a consistent trend going into the future? Because it seems like things just keep getting harder and harder for AIBs nowadays. They get treated really poorly by the companies they're supposed to be partners with that are Nvidia and AMD. And then they also make very little money and they're still expected to live up to this customer service quality that they used to be. Can they live up to that anymore? And could this be something that could make Gigabyte pull an EVGA and just leave the market? So let's talk about the Gigabyte situation. Now, I don't own a Gigabyte card. I did a poll. I wanted to see what AIBs you guys like the most. And uh, Gigabyte did rank the lowest. That might be because this was around all this drama. Did we always not like Gigabyte? I don't know, I, I always thought they're okay. If your GPU breaks in this way, there's like a 10% chance of fixing it because it's a really hard repair. Seeing this being the case and so many cards possibly just being e-waste is really sad, dude. Could be because your GPU is sagging because these cards are so goddamn big nowadays. I mean, I would show you my 3080, but it's in the computer and the 3080 is massive. All of this, I guess, could have been fixed if made their PCBs thicker or stronger because of something else. It could be user error. If it is sagging, this is happening on more expensive cards because the more expensive cards are heavier. Something that's near impossible to repair and on expensive cards means that this is like big money, okay? Like if Gigabyte wants to fix this and issue RMAs to people for their cards, which it seems like they're refusing them. What I'm scared of is I don't think they have the money. If you'd think if their margins were high enough, you know, you just RMA them instantly, okay? Like you don't deal with any drama or anything because a hit to your reputation as a company is way more important than sending somebody a new graphics card. You guys know like Asus, obviously this was motherboards. They were also a little iffy about RMAs at the beginning. I'm pretty sure they're fine now. So if you do have an Asus motherboard, but this is like just one of the customer service things that has happened recently with AIB companies. If you get enough people talking about it and complaining about it, um, hopefully the brand would be aware. So like Lewis brought up in his video, brands that can get away with murder because they have enough cult following. Um, Gigabyte, on the other hand, doesn't tend to have that level no. of following. Gigabyte does not have that reputation. Says no. that. I wanted to say, so just like based off of the reputation thing, like my sister has a MacBook, uh, a MacBook Air with an M1 chip in it. So kind of known for its reliability, a lot of problems. Her keyboard just broke. No, she didn't spill anything on it or drop it or anything. And it just, her keyboard, every all the like random keys just started going out. And uh, if she didn't have Apple Care they wouldn't have taken it under warranty because it would have been like two days over a year, which I think is ridiculous. If it's like Apple, I think I don't think that would scare people away from buying MacBooks. A company like Gigabyte, I don't think is in a position to be like, oh, they're gonna buy our stuff anyways. No, you're not the only one. There's a bunch of other AIBs. We'll gladly take your, your market share. That's because I kind of stopped using Gigabyte back in like the 20 series because of the fact that there was a while there where they were using such flimsy metal on their cooler shrouds that when you would go to put it in the box and you'd push the lid, like the foam piece down, it would actually squish the metal shroud and make the fans no longer turn because it was such a poor design. Yeah, part of me is like, is it really their fault? AIBs don't make that much money nowadays. So back in 2020, and this is according to JPR, which is basically the only company that does like thorough research on the like graphics card, market like, let me know if there's anyone who's as consistent as jpr back in 2020 the gross margin for nvidia and its aibs was 25 and 35 percent okay fast forward to the ampere launch and has grown to 60 percent for nvidia and dropped to 10 percent or lower for its board partners a huge cut to your revenue as an aib partner company and then now uh, it's possible that margins could be as low as five percent I don't know about AMD margins, but how AMD has also been treating their board partners there as like people don't report on it as much, but AI, uh, AMD isn't that much better than Nvidia. They treat them about the same. It's very possible that with these cards, they have to cheap out on their components to make some sort of 
margin on them. And if you look at it, I, I kind of hate being like a doomer for it. Uh, Hardware Unboxed just did a video on AIB cards. This will go in a little bit more in depth with this in a second. But he talks about a bunch of 4070 models, as you know, that 4070 is not a very popular card. Talks about the Founders Edition right away, so. It's also the smallest graphics card featured in this roundup, though thankfully it's not the only dual slot model. For many of you, the Founders Edition version will be irrelevant as you simply can't buy it. For example, so this is the only thing that maybe takes away from this. Look at the like the Founders Edition card is beautiful. Apple, it's not available here in Australia. Smallest card on this I list. I believe this is the case for most other regions. And even availability in the US seems sketchy. I think you can get it at Best Buy. Which is a shame as I believe the FE is one of the best looking and highest quality models out there. Though I suppose depending on your needs, it's certainly not the best. Uh, Founders Edition cards. I mean, I think a lot of people agree with this, especially what you guys even said in, in this poll. And guess what the Founders Edition also is? It's not like how it used to be. These cards are only at the MSRP. They sell for what they're supposed to sell for. And even according to this video, they perform quite well. It's like about the bottom of this list, but it's still at 65 degrees on the GPU temperature. Like that's not bad. <laughs> like let's, let's not get, get caught up here. It looks really good, performs well, it's small. So back to Gigabyte, Gigabyte has to somehow make their cards at thinner margins than what NVIDIA has, still profit on them, try to still have customer service, all at the same time competing with the company that it's way easier for NVIDIA to make a founder's card, right? They can control the price all the way up the ladder. Gigabyte doesn't have the margins to do something like that, but maybe Gigabyte still wants to make money. For me nowadays, I, it's hard for me not to blame them if they cheaped out on their PCBs to do something like that, and then they can't afford to do the returns. <laughs> Because their margin is possibly down to freaking 5% or something. 10% maybe when this card came out. It's it's ridiculous. Like, is this going to be the first of many things that is just going to push AIBs out? Like, they can't compete. Because eventually, they're going to have to say, hey, we have to provide better customer service. We have to make margins in our budget to be able to issue returns to some to, to people if something goes wrong. I think right now with their cards, they're literally just crossing their fingers and hoping nothing goes wrong. Obviously, Gigabyte got unlucky. They cheaped out in the wrong area. Don't know. Uh, other companies aren't really in that much of a different situation. I think uh, Asus has had a lot of problems with their cards recently. Like some of their screws would come and they wouldn't be fully tightened or something. Asus has had those problems. I don't think MSI has really had problems over the years. See how much longer that lasts. At least from NVIDIA's perspective, don't really know about AMD. They're just slowly forcing them out, making it so it's near impossible to compete. Eventually it's going to get to the point where they probably have to raise their costs to make, you know, competitive products that still offer good customer service and stuff like that. They really have no power in this. Like if they don't get the chips from NVIDIA, they don't have business. Like they're a slave to the chip manufacturer and that's just the way it is. It's supposed to be a mutual agreement where these companies uh, make a cool looking product, have a basically a separate marketing team and they're in it. And they're separated from NVIDIA themselves. So if they get some kind of bad PR, that shouldn't directly reflect back on NVIDIA. Why like EVGA left? I mean, I think they saw this coming. AMD, uh, EVGA, <laughs> as you know, which is really funny. So if you go into the comments of favorite graphics card designs, my poll, there, a lot of people commented different brands. I could only put five options on this list. So I would have put more if I could, but there's quite a few people that literally just said EVGA. EVGA, EVGA, EVGA. EVGA was one of those companies in the graphics card market that made good cards and had outstanding customer service. As things have gone downhill and they get less and less margins, they can't provide that customer service anymore. And if they would to still provide that customer service, their cards would be priced so much higher than the competition. To the average consumer, doesn't know that they're not going to get the customer service in the future. EVGA just couldn't be competitive at those prices anymore. It wasn't sustainable. I don't want this to like be taken like completely wrong or anything. Like Gigabyte still isn't right for doing this. Um, their PCBs are cracking. They're bricking people's cards. In a hypothetical scenario, which it's not exactly proven yet. Again, the running theories for this is GPU sag is causing this problem or it's user error, error when people take their graphics cards out 
or put them in, but more likely taking them out. Maybe they don't unlock the pin and then they pull on it and it cracks the PCB. So it could be user error. On the GPU sag front of things, that's completely Gigabyte's fault. User error is a little bit more iffy. I'm not gonna lie, like your card shouldn't break just by pulling on it a little bit. So I can't really blame people for accidentally doing that. And that's still a problem with your graphics card design at the end of the day. It's like how uh, MSI designed a solution for the 12 pin VHP power connector that Nvidia made with their 4000 series. They had to design this so that, hey, when you plug it in, then you know that it's plugged in all the way because if you guys aren't aware, if you don't plug in this power connector all the way, it will get extremely hot and it will melt. And that was a user error thing, technically. But the fact that it's a user error that happened many, many times, and it was very hard to tell if you plugged it in correctly, kind of was also a flaw of the design. So that same thing, even if say from Gigabyte in their graphics card, like if maybe people didn't unplug it correctly or take their GPU out of the slot correctly and they kind of pulled on it a little bit too much. Yeah, it's the user's fault. Is it really though? I feel like it's half and half. Hard to blame somebody for that. And especially when you see maybe the issue coming back more and more. <laughs> no matter how you put it, it's not good to see. Dr. Kunin from a little bit ago says that Gigabyte has a great RMA process. I sent them a 6870 one gigabyte. <laughs> it's funny, it's one gigabyte. They sent it back. They sent back a better card actually. And they were kind and curious and professional. But also back when those cards were out, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, they had better margins on their products. Things can change pretty quick when you don't have money. Something else I wanted to point out about AIBs that scares me for the future of their sales. This is a no offense to hardware unboxed. I think this was a good video. It covered all of these, these graphics cards for the 4070. We uploaded this a day ago. If you guys know anything about hardware unboxed videos, they usually do better than that in a day. And that's because people don't care about them. Like why would people want to research all the AIB brands in a big roundup video when nobody wants to buy them? People don't really care about the 40 cards. In my opinion, the 4070 is the best card that has released that's like obtainable to most people. I mean, 4090s are genuinely good, but they cost so much it doesn't matter. 4070s are relatively kind of obtainable to people at $600. I'm not saying it's cheap and they are actually decent value for their money. So like you would think that if any card was going to do the best in this generation for a video like this showing the research about AIB cards and letting people compare them for their buying decisions in the future, if any of the cards would do best for a video like this, it would be the 4070. Yet it still doesn't do that good. Think about how much less money these companies are making right now. It's ridiculous. It's such a bad situation for them. I know that they just came off of, you know, a couple years ago where mining was huge. And some AIBs, I think MSI, they were selling directly to miners to uh, make money. Yeah, maybe a couple years ago, their profits were really good. That maybe right now it's okay if they sit on, you know, lower profits, but how much longer? Our AIB is going to be able to sit on lower profits and let Nvidia and AMD cut their margins even more and more over time before they just can't sustain it all together. Now, screw you miners. Yeah. Screw you miners. So AIBs are in this tough spot. It's like, Hey, do we keep producing products for something that people don't care about? And maybe this is like the dark ages and maybe they're hoping that in the future they'll be able to come out of it and make it through and maybe margins will be better over time. Or they sit here and they're like, hey, maybe it's not sustainable anymore. And they just, they just book it like EVGA did. Sapphire graphics card here. And um, as far as I know, Sapphire has been fine things. And uh, I think XFX has been fine. Um, there's some other cards that are a little bit more niche, but as we know, Yestin will always be fine. Can I get some yeses in chat, by the way? Yes, yes, yes. It has been a conversation that AIBs might not be around and it's been basically ever since Nvidia started to go pretty all in with their cooler designs. Went in and did like a founder's card that looked good, performed pretty well, because as you know, before this, their founder's cards had blower coolers on them and those didn't perform that well. So see a lot of yeses, so that's uh, what a W. What a W in the PC gaming community. 30 series came out, looked really good. 
and performed decently well. This conversation has come up that AIBs might be getting phased out. <laughs> How am I going to buy a GPU with an anime girl on it now? I was like, oh no. I agree, man. We're in sad times. We're in the dark ages. I don't think they should go away. I think AIBs are cool and it's cool to have options. It's kind of like a thing in the PC gaming community. I guess as it would become more mainstream and easy for people to buy, it would stray away from this. But one of the cool parts about PC gaming is like you can research and customize your PC to be like whatever you want it to be. You can find, like for me, I'm someone who prioritizes like form over function. Like it can't look terrible, but I want it to perform the best. So like in my system right now, I have a 3080 and I have the tough model, which wasn't the best looking model in my opinion, but man, it performed well. Like that's how I, I feel about it. But that gives me in PC gaming, the ability to customize my computer. Hey, it's like, I don't care about that stuff. So I don't pay for it. That's just me. And anybody has basically whatever they want to do with it. It's all up to you guys. You could do crazy stuff like this and you can spend as much money as you want on it. He's kind of flexing, but have a good time. You know, it's, it can be more than a hobby. Maybe like obviously be reasonable with how much money you spend. <laughs> you know, you can do what you want. I love that about PC gaming. That was one of the things that got me into it, is like, Hey, back in 2016, I built my first PC with a i5 2500, bought it used and a GTX 770. And the reason I'm able to do that and save money on different components is because buy use components and then like pick and choose where I spend as much money. Other options don't give you that. That's one of the beautiful things about PC gaming, but also one of the things that takes it away from being more mainstream is that you have to do your research and stuff like that. There's already enough tiers and price ranges of graphics cards to choose from, and then you have to compare with the used market and everything. Is Nvidia also seeing in the future that's like, hey, we can simplify this down for consumers so that you don't have to think so much when you go to buy a graphics card. In the future, maybe the founders are the only ones. This would allow Nvidia, again, I don't know what AMD's goals are for this, you know, make as many margins as they want if they don't have to compete inwardly with their board partners. A situation like this with Gigabyte and their, their cracking PCBs, something like this could push them over the edge. They could have a, I was about to say like a Thanos moment, but they could have an EVGA moment, you know what I mean? Just like, and it all disappears, you know? A lot of us love AIBs, and a lot of us are probably attached to certain brands. And they all have their own reputations. It was a weird thing. I do want to discuss those, like, from the beginning, like, I guess it was good when graphics cards started to release. I mean, graphics cards are pretty old now. I mean, probably over 20 years old, like, to where you could buy one and slot it into your computer, right? To have board partners in the first place. When you think about it, it's like, well, I guess they didn't really have Founders Edition cards at the beginning. So whoever made the chips, the AIBs, uh, were the ones that just uh, actually made it into something to exist. Uh, to make it into a card that you can actually buy. And it isn't just a freaking chip. But over time, I guess it's evolved. Where it's like, it kind of sounds weird to say, as a chip manufacturer making a product that you sell to consumers, to have companies that you work in partnership that you are directly competing with as well. Like the Founders Edition cards from Nvidia and the reference card from AMD compete directly with their board partners, yet they all want the market to grow. I, I find it odd, if I'm being honest. Nowadays, why they even exist, even though I like them. It also seems like nowadays, the design of graphics cards has generally been pretty solved. By the end of this video, he rounded up nine 4070s. And yeah, the 4070 wasn't hard to cool. I mean, it's like a 200 watt card. It actually only draws a little bit more than the Arc A770. And you know, Intel, Intel nailed this, uh, well, kind of nailed it, other than it being glued together. Um, Intel kind of nailed this GP on their first try. So um, if you do look at these temperatures here, the uh, Founders Edition is generally down towards the bottom of the list. so with some of the highest temperatures where nvidia is giving the the other cards some slack the aib some slack is like hey at least your cards can perform better than ours okay like that is the founder's edition and that's why it's called a reference card like i wouldn't put it past nvidia say in a in a few generations just say hey you can't even beat our founder's edition cards like we just cool them so well they're at msrp we control the prices on the back end all the AIBs buy chips from NVIDIA, so they don't have the option of, you know, increasing their margins. Where they're literally just like, hey, the Founders Edition, it's better than your card now. 
So good luck, nerds. Again, why do they? Why do these companies need to stick around if they already did all the research and development that Nvidia and AMD need to make cards that perform successfully and consumers actually want to buy? Oh, by the way, not only are we Yustin enjoyers here, we're also Jug enjoyers. Um, so make sure to get you guys a Jug, sixty-four ounce minimum, obviously. Yeah, AIB cards do overclock. Um, better because they have more cooling headroom. So let, I, I want to show you how much overclocking really makes a difference. As much as like the argument used to be that AIBs can overclock really well because they used to overclock really well, cards are already like pushed nearly to their limit. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't amount to a whole lot. Uh, let's just put it on ultra without ray tracing. So I think uses DLSS quality as well. So we're getting about, you know, just let it stabilize about 110 111 fps um so let's go ahead and overclock this you can see in the top left too we're drawing what about 330 watts 3080 uses a lot of power if you were wondering every one of the eu is having a heart attack that's why you would maybe get uh 4070 so i could break that link unlink that and up the power limit this is the power limit to the graphics card i'm pretty sure power jumped up anywhere from 5 to 10 watts more um, that could have been, I mean, this could be just the fan. So that's why I'm not hundred percent sure. So what I'll do is I'll also our megahertz on the GPU is at about 1890 megahertz. So like 260 megahertz. Okay. Sorry. I had to zoom in a little bit wrong spot. Let's go ahead and confirm this. So we hard crashed, <laughs> which is funny. I don't know if that show that actually kind of proves the point even more. The GPU is already pushed so far to its limit. I only added 260 megahertz to it and it hard crashed. It's kind of like, what could AIBs even do <laughs> to rewrite your VBIOS? That sounds like a good idea. I'll make sure I do that. Completely hey, brick your card. More bricked than, um, so then, man, that sounds kind of sus. More bricked than uh, Gigabyte graphics yeah. cards right now. But like the point being is that like AIBs, it used to be a marketing point that Hey, overclocking it is really important and like, hey, that's a big selling point because you can get a significant performance boost having better cooling on a different card. Nowadays, these cards are already pushed to the limit, like out of the box. I mean, I'm not going to lie, the 3080 in Cyberpunk there performing at native 1440p on ultra settings, 100 FPS. I mean, it was in the training area, but, you know, it'd probably get like 70 to 80 outside of that. There's like one hand where the PC gaming market right now is full of amazing deals. On the used market, if you look on eBay and you see an RTX 3080, really good deal. I mean, you can get a 3080. That's that fast that I just showed you in Cyberpunk. $425, like, <laughs> you're willing to buy used? I mean, there's like some crazy deals out there right now. On one hand, the PC gaming market is so accessible to get really good performance, yet the games that are coming out, a, a game you're genuinely very, very excited for that has come out in the past year, or maybe even two years. Oh yeah, <laughs> Dragon was excited for Gollum. It's like they're good deals, but there aren't very good games to play. And the new gen cards are so unexciting and straight boring. Um, there isn't really anything good about them. And that again reflects back to the AIBs. AIBs don't make sales when people don't buy graphics cards. As stupid as it is, the freaking Among Us was a really fun game was actually a lot older than before it became popular. It was like, it had already been out for like a year or two before it became popular. Like you can run Among Us on, on your freaking six or seven year old smartphone. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just little 2D beans in a game. Hey, like AIB cards and Gigabyte's in a tough spot. They're like, this might be something that just sends Gigabyte over. They're just like, hey, why are we still doing this? <laughs> There's kind of like that, it had the same thing happened to me, uh, Overwatch 2 and them dropping PV. It was less that it was, oh, you didn't see it coming or anything. Or it's like, oh, Gigabyte is gonna have a problem with their graphics cards at some point. More the thing was like, it was kind of like a wake up call or it's like, why are we still here just to suffer every night? I wonder if this is like a wake up call for Gigabyte is like, hey, should we just get out of this market? And what sucks is that I feel like that's exactly what Nvidia wants these companies to do is eventually just get forced out where they don't have an option to stay anymore. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the stream. You guys can uh, say your goodbyes. All right, you guys have a good one. Peace.